I'm Carol Ann Riddell and welcome to Arts in the City. We are in Greenwich Village at a groundbreaking exhibit on iconic rock band, The Velvet Underground. We'll take you inside for a closer look a little bit later in the show. But first, we begin with some laughs and social commentary. Barry Mitchell introduces us to comedian Nagin Farsad, who uses humor to get at the issues of our day. Meet Nagin Farsad. Today, we're going to talk about the Manafort trial and whether Jeff Sessions has a backbone. We'll also talk about the state of the economy. And finally, Twitter, what has it done to jokes and to the republic? Ask Nagin to describe herself and she'll say, oh, just another Iranian-American Muslim female comedian, author, filmmaker, podcaster. Like most comedians, I have a, um, a master's degree in public policy and another one in African-American studies. Of so, course. Yeah. Today, comedy with a social conscience from the outrageous Nagin Farsad. I tried to fix the Israeli-Palestinian conflict by dating a Jewish guy. It didn't work. Tell us about your podcast, Fake the Nation. Fake the Nation is a political comedy roundtable. It's me and a rotating cast of comedians. We gather every week to talk about the news, to scream about democracy. Once you get into that lawyer stuff, I just feel like I'm reading the back of a Tylenol bottle. You know what I mean? Yeah. I just zone out. You were brought up in a hotbed of comedy, Palm Springs, California. <laughs> I grew up around uh, senior citizens. I was the only kid in my neighborhood. I got my first part in a theater production in high school. And I remember feeling like when the audience was laughing, I was like, right now, I have them laughing and I could say anything and they'll listen. Mm. And it felt very powerful, you know what I mean? I got that, oh, I was like, is this what Mal Zedong feels like all the time? Your book is called How to Make White People Laugh. I call it a memoir meets social justice comedy manifesto because I talk about a lot of the stuff that I've done with comedy as an activist. I am Iranian American, I'm also Muslim. As a social justice comedian, it's my goal to convert these haters because they hate a lot of things which lead to negative outcomes like uh, racism, violence, and Ted Nugent. <laughs> what is your go-to routine to make white people laugh. <laughs> My mom was like, uh, Negin, why are you scared? Have you had intergender flesh relation? <laughs> Everyone has a weird family. It's like something very universal. Um, it's something that really brings people together. It's like, every, like, oh, is, is your mom out of her mind? So is mine. <laughs> Negin was looking for a project to merge comedy with social justice and community service. A live Muslim is here to answer your questions. That led to the documentary. Muslim. You know they are a coming. We just barely just let the gays in recently. We rounded up a bunch of Muslim American comedians in a nonviolent way, and <laughs> we went around the country to places like Alabama and Tennessee and, wow. and you know, uh, Utah, just places where they love the muzzies. Can I invite you to a stand-up comedy show? It's absolutely free. It's tonight at 8 o'clock. It's called The Muslims Are Coming. There's a bunch of Muslims on stage, but they're hilarious. And we did shows there, but the idea was to really bridge the gap to try and dispel Islamophobia. You know the eclipse? We did it for Allah. I'm standing in the middle of the dance floor and I see this dude checking me out. And so I did what any good Muslim girl would do and I allowed him to grind up on me right here. In the film, you had these little booths on the street, mm -hmm. ask a Muslim. Mm -hmm. What were some of the questions people down south asked you? Well, how do you feel about 9-11? As a New Yorker, obviously I think 9-11 was like traumatizing and horrible um, but but because that's not a message that's being you know spread effectively people still have that question my last film is a romantic comedy it's called third street blackout it's a romantic comedy set in the blackout after hurricane sandy in new york city just relax be yourself but a better version of yourself there's somebody i want you to meet i wanted people to see an iranian muslim in a casual, fun, romantic comedy that wasn't about being brown. It's important for me to start seeing women of color in these roles that we really typically associate with America's sweetheart, and America's sweetheart has been a, like a blonde woman forever. I've been exposed to more cultures than the average American. That's cool. Mm -hmm. And I like people so if anyone ever gives me the opportunity like to to share with them my story in exchange for also hearing theirs uh that's a win for me like i love that if i was a, a someone's first muslim friend 
then great. Then they'll associate Muslims with me forever. Download Fake the Nation at Earwolf or iTunes. The Muslims are coming and Third Street Blackout, available at Amazon, iTunes, and your favorite streaming sites. Nagin Farsad, everyone, thank you so much. Thank you. And you're watching Arts in the City. Holiday season is in the air, and that means lots of big blockbuster movies and Oscar contenders. Neil Rosen and his buddies are back to talk about the lineup with plenty of opinions on the hits and misses. Here's Talking Movies. The holiday movie season is in full swing with dozens of new award-worthy films coming your way through the end of the year. I'm joined, as always, by my colleagues Lisa Rossman from Science and Sirens and Bill McCuddy from Gold Derby. And together we're going to tell you about a few of them. Bill, tell me about a big or prestigious movie hitting theaters soon. It's called Mary Poppins Returns. Here's the plot. Mary Poppins Returns. <laughs> Basically, uh, Emily Blunt, and to be blunt, I have to say this doesn't look that great, comes back 25 years later after the original story, but she, Mary Poppins, has an age. The Banks kids have grown up, but there's more problems at the Banks household that Mary Poppins has to fly in and try and rescue. You got uh, a huge cast, but the real problem here is Rob Marshall. This is the guy who gave us Chicago lean and mean and it was good, but then he gets things like Into the Woods and he gets all these other CGI extras and people in this movie like Meryl Streep and Dick Van Dyke's in this thing for God's sake. Mm -hmm. uh, it looks like too much and, and I'm a little concerned. Honestly, I'm not sure why we need this film, but I love the cast and crew, so I'm going to hang in there. Well, Lin-Manuel Miranda is, is, I'm, is in this, and he didn't write the music, which Call I'm your shocked. agent, Lin. You're he, in trouble. He did Hamilton, <laughs> and this is, I'm, I'm, right. this is the okay. first project that he chooses to do. But anyway, the jury's out. We'll see. You know, not, 54 years since the last okay. one. Right. All right, Lisa, what, give me a movie. Widows. Uh, this is the latest from Steve McQueen, who brought us such major fare as 12 Years a Slave and Shame. This is reportedly his first even remotely light film. It's a female crime caper. Uh, the pedigree is amazing. Uh, McQueen adapted it with Gone Girl author Gillian Flynn, and they adapted this from a British miniseries which was written by the Prime Suspect creator Linda LaPlante. Anyone who loved Prime Suspect should be excited. The, st the cast, Viola Davis, Jackie Weaver, Michelle Rodriguez, Rodriguez, and some famous men I don't care about because they no, die you early. Don't kill, you don't kill Liam Neeson uh, early in a movie. Yes, Robert you do. Duvall. Yes, you do if Viola Davis is in it. They the point is, and I'm going to make it, is that there's some serious buzz coming out of Toronto about how great this film is, and it's exciting to see uh, Steve McQueen wrestling with slightly lighter fare, though, of course, he's tackling racial relations in Chicago. Well, Ocean's 8 did this already, and <laughs> so the bar is set pretty oh, high. Oh, yes, there's not a need for another <laughs> well, female movie. Well, their, their, their men died doing, and yeah, they, they yep. have to complete the $5 million heist. That's yep. the thing. I don't know. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, there's another movie I'm really looking forward to called The Favorite. It takes place in 18th century England, stars Emma Stone and Rachel Weisz as two cousins who are vying for the attentions and affection of Queen Anne. The Queen is frail and emotional unstable and um, they're you know she's happy to turn over all her behind-the-scenes power to whichever one of these she likes best hence the title okay. the favorite it's sexually charged film it's described as bawdy and light comedy and I'm really looking forward. I want to see this it looks sounds like a reality show they're trying to get, vote each other off you're, you're downplaying the big point which is this is the latest from Yorgis Lathimos who did the lobster which is a really interesting surreal film I think he's one of the most innovative directors working today so I'm excited uh, I'm excited too. Killing movie which is bad movie. which is bad Lisa tell me about Roma Okay, Roma is the much-awaited feature from Alfonso Cuaron. Uh, he brought us Gravity, Y tu mama también, Children of Men, and he's saying this is his most personal film Oh, you yet. love Y tu mama I love all his movies. I think he's a genius. This is loosely based on his 1970s childhood in Mexico City. It follows a domestic worker through one year of her life. And the big news here is that even though it sounds like a small story, it's reportedly as dizzying as scale visually and narratively as all his other films. It's in black and white. Nobody's going to go see <laughs> Oh, you're so boring. So 
name. He grew up in black and white Mexico, I guess. Bill, yeah, yes. We love Viggo Mortensen. He's got a movie coming out. Yeah, this one is called uh, The Green Book. It was yeah. the People's Choice at the Toronto Film Festival, and it's basically Viggo Mortensen as uh, a bouncer in the 1960s hired to drive pianist Mahershala Ali of Moonlight uh, to gigs in the South. It's based on the Negro motorist Green Book, which uh, dealt with the, a real thing that dealt with the Jim Crow laws and where uh, blacks could and couldn't stay, could and couldn't eat. Uh, this has got Oscar written all over it, and it has a great surprise, which is it's directed by Peter Farrelly of the Farrelly which Brothers, is crazy. who gave us like uh, there's something about Mary, Dumb and Dumber. This yeah. is smart and smarter. Right. I love Mahershala Ali so much that I'm interested in anything he does. But when I first heard the premise, I was like, Is this a reverse driving? It looks, Daisy? Yeah, right. It looks I mean, like by the numbers. Wa watch the trail of Vigo's like vintage New York accent is hysterical, and it looks like an important and great film. Uh, Boy Erased is coming out. I'm really looking forward to this particular. film film, the son of a Baptist preacher is forced to participate in a church-sponsored Pray Away the Gay Conversion <laughs> Therapy Program, or he's exiled from his family forever. Lu Lucas Hedges plays the, plays the kids subjected to this. Uh, Nicole Kidman and Russell Crowe are the parents, and it was written and directed by Joel Edgerton, who we know predominantly from acting. Um, he has a spark for himself in this movie as well, and um, the movie's supposed to be an emotional powerhouse. Yeah. I, I, I'm highly into. I mean, the danger, obviously, is that this could be too much of a message movie, but reportedly it's very subtle, very strong, and I have to say, I read the book by Jared Conley, and it's terrific. Uh, I feel bad that we just laugh out loud when we hear Pray Away the Gay, but like this feels like a lifetime -y kind of movie to me, elevated by great performances. I, I want to see it, but I'm a little worried. Well, to find out about lots more films coming out this holiday season, check us out online at tv.cuny.edu, where Lisa, Bill, and myself have a lengthier discussion on this movie season. For Arts in the City, I'm Neil Rosen. This month's Book It, a story about the enduring power of female friendship. We sat down with author Shoba Rao at Shakespeare & Co. to talk about her debut novel, Girls Burn Brighter. Shoba, thank you so much for joining us today. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. So your book is called Girls Burn Brighter. It's incredibly gripping, uh, the story of these two young girls who have um, this very deep but kind of tortured friendship. Sure, yeah. Can you give us just a brief description of the story and how it unfolds? Sure. So it's about two girls, Purnima and Savita, who are growing up in a small village in South India. And one of them, Savita, gets trafficked into the United States. And her friend, Purnima, who ends up in a really difficult marriage, um, she ends up leaving that marriage and decides she is going to go find Savita. Now, she hasn't heard from her friend or seen her in two years, so she's really starting with you know, absolutely no information to go on, but she is relentless. I was really struck that you decided to delve into the nature of female friendship with these two young girls who are not together for most of the book. Sure, yeah. They're not in touch. Yeah. They really can't even be sure the other's alive. Yes, I mean, truly. Indeed. So what made you decide to approach it that way? Because we don't, it's not a typical way to look at a friendship, but yet the friendship drives the story. Yeah, well, once I established uh, their deep connection at the beginning of the book, it felt time to separate them and really explore the strength and the deep sort of river of love that they have for one another. Um, and the best way I could conceive to do that was to separate them and ask how much, what will you go through as friends, as human beings, to find the other? The brutality of what these girls go through is, at some moments in the book, just overwhelming. Mm -hmm. um, there's physical abuse, there's sexual abuse, there's human trafficking. Uh -huh. It does feel really relentless what made you choose to make it feel that relentless? When I first started writing the novel, uh, before I started writing, I should say, I promised myself two things. One was that I wouldn't look away, no matter how bad it got for the girls, that I wouldn't look away. 
And the other was that I wouldn't flinch. Like I would look at it and I would do it unflinchingly. Those are the two promises I made to myself as a writer because I, I really wanted to honor the journey of these girls, you know? And it felt important to me that I not sort of dilute or in any way um, reduce their journey or make it easier just to make it easier, right? Just for the sake of, you know, palatability. Both of the girls serve as narrators. You, you yes. switch back and forth. And I thought that was a really interesting approach. I felt like I got to know both of them very well. Uh -huh. I was reading one and yet looking forward to the other, not feeling that I was more invested in one than the other. Oh, good. So what made you decide to do that? You know, I, I wanted to, um, it, I wanted it to be a quest, right? So when there's a quest in a novel, there's an object or a thing or a person that is desired that is, you know, the object of the quest. And so I thought, how interesting if we got the perspectives of both the person who was looking mm -hmm. and the person who was being, being looked for. for. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And so, you know, usually it's like a pot of gold or something, but in this <laughs> case, it's a person, right? So I thought, let's insert that person's perspective. So we always ask this question, do you have any particular writing habits, quirks, interesting things that you do when you write? You know, I don't have any sort of particular everyday quirks, but the writing of this novel specifically, because I was unable to write it in my apartment in San Francisco, I ended up borrowing a friend's cabin in the Badlands of South Dakota. Really? Yes, in a really isolated part of the Badlands on open prairie. There was nothing out there. Just wow, that's interesting. And you just and stayed there until you finished? Yes. Two months, start to finish. And I knew I wasn't going to leave the, that, the Badlands until I finished. Shoba, thank you so much. Uh, I really enjoyed the book, and I really enjoyed talking to you. Thank you. It was my pleasure. Now to Greenwich Village for a trip back in time with legendary rock band The Velvet Underground. From music to pop culture to Andy Warhol, this exhibit has it all. The exhibition is called uh, The Velvet Underground Experience and the idea is uh, really to dive into the Velvet Underground world. For this we need to uh, have people diving into America of that period, then New York of that period, uh, and then you can begin to understand why the encounter between Lou Reed and John Cale was uh, such a creative blast. The roots of the Velvets, New York, the story of the Velvets, and the legacy of this band, which is quite interesting because uh, they had almost no success during their lifetime, and success came after. The legacy of the Velvets is uh, music, of course, but also in films, in literature, in arts, in um, style, uh, fashion, pushing the boundaries, uh, pushing the boundaries and be totally free in their art. And I think this is one of the things that uh, the generation that came after, uh, this is what the main thing they got from the Velvet is this uh, spirit of freedom. I think that for the young generation, uh, it can be a real uh, discovery. You still have time to catch the Velvet Underground exhibit. It runs until December 30th.
Near the corner of 10th Avenue and West 42nd Street stands Manhattan Plaza, a towering apartment complex. Megalie Laguerre Wilkinson has more on a documentary that explains how the building changed the lives of artists and artists changed the neighborhood. Academy Award nominated filmmaker Alice Elliott's latest documentary project is a portrait of an unlikely hero, Manhattan Plaza. It's a building whose grit, determination, and innovation help transform an entire neighborhood. Manhattan Plaza has 1,689 apartments. There's a thousand car garage, 15 commercial tenants. It takes up a city block in New York City. It is a very, very big place with about 3,500 people living here. Construction for Manhattan Plaza began in the early 1970s. The building was originally conceived of as luxury housing for middle and upper middle class New Yorkers. But a citywide financial crisis, compounded by the neighborhood's reputation for drugs, crime and prostitution, thwarted the plan. Without prospective tenants willing to pay the upscale prices, financing fell apart, and the vacant complex threatened to drag down an already deteriorating neighborhood. It shouldn't have existed. The, the stars aligned. You know, the things happened. It was a crisis. They didn't have a solution. In response to the crisis, a diverse group of stakeholders developed an audacious proposal use subsidies from the federal government to pay for the building, and in return, apartments would be offered as low-income housing with 70% of the units set aside exclusively for people working in the performing arts. When they first uh, proposed the idea, uh, they had to do a survey and prove that there were enough artists to actually fill the building. Before she was a director, Alice worked as an actress, and her own experience with Manhattan Plaza provides a personal perspective to the story. I was a young actress, and uh, one of my opportunities was to go and have an interview for an apartment at Manhattan Plaza. And I started walking over there. It was dirty, it was dangerous, it was scary. And I thought, you know what? I can't live here. Slowly, the building's growing popularity eventually eclipsed the stigma of the neighborhood. And by 1979, every single apartment was rented with an additional 2,000 applicants on the waiting list. But the other challenge surfaced. Who qualifies as a performing artist? A question addressed in the film. And we hammered out the regulations for the community and what meant, what meant being a performing artist. The requirements were very, very strict. And I was wondering if if comedians fit that bill, because I never really considered myself that. But uh, I was told, yes, they do They do fit. You could apply. You didn't just get in here because I thought you were a performing artist. A committee of your peers had to review the files. Not many people realize this, but the first hundred or so apartments that were rented here were rented on the basis of live auditions. So I moved in November 1977. I was paying $57 a month, and this was in... Um, November, I moved in November 1977. That was my rent, $57 a month. As the building stabilized, so did the neighborhood. The drugs, crime, and sex workers slowly disappeared, a change Alice attributes to Manhattan Plaza and the artists who lived there. One of the messages that I got as a child was that artists are not very valuable to society. It's something you can do on the side, it's very peripheral. I learned through this affordable housing and the research that I did how valuable artists are to society. Artists are actually can drive the economy. Larry David is just one of the many performers who has lived at Manhattan Plaza. Other notables include Terence Howard, Angela Lansbury, Giancarlo Esposito, and Alicia Keys, who in one scene talks about what it was like growing up in an artistic community. The whole reason I can play piano is because of the woman we found in that building. A woman was leaving and couldn't take the piano, and she said, if you can move it, you can have it. And it was an upright piano, an old brown upright piano. And so we dragged it across the Manhattan Plaza ourselves. <laughs> Today, Manhattan Plaza is a successful example of artist-centered living spaces and their stabilizing effect on a community. One project in East Harlem transformed an abandoned public school building into an arts facility with 89 units of affordable housing for artists and their families. 
and across the country, similar projects are cropping up. I think what I like about the film is that it, it doesn't just appeal to artists. It appeals to people who are looking at their communities and hoping to be creative about what can we have here? How can we solve some of our problems? And I hope it destigmatizes artists in a way that makes it feel like, well, artists would be safe for us, that we could include artists, that they're not some strange group over there, that actually they, they, I could live next door to an artist, that it wouldn't be that bad. Miracle on 42nd Street will open the 2018 Franklin International Film Festival, and a North American television broadcast is in the works. For Arts in the City, I'm Magalie Laguerre-Wilkinson. That is our show for today. Thanks so much for joining us. Remember, you can find us online whenever you need your New York City arts and culture fix. I'm Carol Ann Riddell. We'll see you next time on Arts in the City.